Dear ladies and gentlemen, I love you. Thank you and welcome you all to tonight's presentation. Before I start, can I ask all of you to switch off your mobiles? And please don't take any pictures or recordings. I'd like to thank everyone attending, and I'd like to thank Professor Van Lomel and Dr. Azmaj for providing us with a valuable time tonight in order to discuss the topic of endless consciousness. Tonight's program will begin with a 60-minute presentation by Professor Van Lomel on endless consciousness. <coughs> Professor Van Lomel is a world-renowned cardiologist and researcher in the field of near-death experiences. He has written many articles on the relation between consciousness and the brain. His work has been published in renowned journals such as The Lancet, and his book entitled Endless Consciousness was a bestseller in 2008 in Holland, and has since been translated to many languages. I'm sure in tonight's presentation, he will touch on many of the main themes of his, of his research, and provide us with many thoughtful ideas. After Professor Van Lommel's presentation, I'm delighted that Dr. Asmaj has also agreed to provide us a brief 20-minute presentation on the topic of endless consciousness from the Gnostic point of view. Dr. Arthmeis has two doctorates, one in law and another in comparative religions. He's also a famous researcher in the field of Gnostic traditions, and he himself is a well-known Sufi master. Tonight in his presentation, he will shine a light on the topic of consciousness from a Gnostic point of view. I'm sure you'll find the contrast and the similarities between the Gnostic view on consciousness and Professor Van Lommel's scientific studies on consciousness also of great interest. <coughs> After the presentations, there will be an disc open discussion forum where both Professor Van Lommel and Dr. Asmaj will be open to taking questions from the audience. I have in the past generally found this part of the presentation of great interest as the audience opinions and questions have always generated thought and open ideas. So now I'm going to hand over to my proceedings to Professor Van Lommel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased that I get the opportunity to discuss here today in London, together with Dr. Asmayesh, the concept of the continuity of consciousness based on scientific research on near-death experiences, NDE, in survivors of cardiac arrest. In human history, the question has always been asked, could there be consciousness beyond the brain? And how could new research on the continuity of consciousness could affect the understanding of life, death, the structure of reality, and the possibility of a so-called afterlife. An NDE, or an experience of enhanced consciousness during a period of apparent coma, still gives rise to many unbelieving and critical questions. But, as our already one century ago William James had said, to study the abnormal is the best way of understanding the normal. How can it scientifically be explained that people can have clear memories from a period of obvious unconsciousness? Or how is it possible that permanent life changes occur after cardiac arrest of only two minutes? An NDE is an unforgettable confrontation with unlimited dimensions in our consciousness. As long as one not has experienced an NDE himself, it seems impossible to really understand the impact and the life-changing after-effects of this overwhelming experience. The existing worldview has radically changed. Quote, it felt as if I had become another person, but with the same identity. Another quote. You can be physically dead, but your mind lives on. Only one thing matters. Your attitude toward other people. 
I accept life as it is, and I am no longer afraid of death. I will not only talk about changes in consciousness during or after an NDE, but above all, I want to discuss my ideas about the relationship between consciousness and the brain. Important questions for me were, how is consciousness related to the integrity of brain function? Is it possible to gain insight in this relationship? Is there a biological basis of consciousness anyway? We can distinguish between both temporary and timeless aspects of our consciousness. This prompts the following question. Is it possible to speak of a beginning of our consciousness? And will our consciousness ever end? I realize that my approach will be new or unexpected for most neuroscientists, and that my conclusions will not always be in conformity with the currently widely accepted materialistic paradigm in Western science. In my recently re released book, Consciousness Beyond Life, The Science of the Near-Death Experience, I write in many more details about my ideas about the continuity of our consciousness than I can explain here today in my lecture. And I also realize that many aspects of consciousness are still a great mystery. So let us first ask some <coughs> questions about consciousness. Where am I when I'm asleep? Where is my consciousness during sleep? And according, according to current science, it should not be possible to experience consciousness during general anesthesia. But how could it be explained that some patients after the surgery with general anesthesia can describe into detail what has been said and done, mostly during a complication? Should we also consider the possibility of conscious experience during coma? Recently, several books were published in the Netherlands about what patients had experienced in their consciousness during coma following severe traffic accident or during coma following complications with cerebral hypertension after surgery for a brain tumor. This last patient being declared brain dead by his neurologist and neurosurgeon. But fortunately, the family refused to give permission for organ donation and after three weeks of coma, he regained consciousness. These patients reported that during the period of the coma, they had experienced clear consciousness with memories, emotions and perception out and above the body, also seeing nurses, physicians and family in and around the ICU. Does brain death really mean death, death, or is it just the beginning of the process of dying that can last for hours to days? And what happens to, to consciousness during this period? According to the many reports of an NDE, we should consider the possibility that someone can experience consciousness during cardiac arrest. But should we also ask ourselves whether there could be still consciousness after someone really has died, when his body is cold? He who wants answers will have to ask these questions. In 1969, during my rotating internship, a patient was successfully resuscitated in the cardiac ward by electrical defibrillation after a period of unconsciousness of about four minutes. The patient regained consciousness and we as resuscitation team were of course very happy. It was the beginning of the possibilities of CPR in CCUs. But the patient seemed to be very, very disappointed. <laughs> he told me about going through a tunnel, seeing a light, and also beautiful colors and hearing music. I have never forgotten this event, but I did not do anything with it. And in that time, I did not know that in human history, the same experience has been told in many cultures and many religions and in old times, as shown in this painting from 1480 by the Dutch painter Rionimus Bos, showing deceased people escorted through a tunnel to the light. Only years later, in 1975, 
Raymond Moody first described the so-called near-death experiences. And only in 1986, I read about these experiences in the book by George Ritchie, entitled Return from Tomorrow, which relates what he experienced during a period of clinical death of nine minutes duration in 1943 during his medical study. And after reading this book, I started to interview my patients who had survived the cardiac arrest. And to my great surprise, within two years, 12 patients out of 50 survivors of cardiac arrest in the past told me about their NDE. For me, it all started with scientific curiosity, because according to our current medical concepts, it is not possible to experience consciousness during cardiac arrest when circulation and breathing have ceased. I grew up in an academic environment in which I had been taught that there is a reductionist and materialistic explanation for everything, and that it was obvious that consciousness was the product of a functioning brain. And up until that point I had always accepted this as indisputable true. But now the phenomenon of near-death experiences raised a number of fundamental questions. And then there is a special state of consciousness that occurs during an imminent or actual period of physical, psychological or emotional death. But how and why does an NDE occur? How does the con content of an NDE come about? Why does a person's life change so radically after an NDE? I was unable to accept most of the answers to these questions because <coughs> they seemed incomplete, incorrect or unfounded. <coughs> but first, what is an NDE? Some people who have experienced or have survived a life threatening crisis report an extraordinary conscious experience. An NDE can be defined as the reported memory of the range of impressions during a special state of consciousness, including a number of universal elements, such as an out of body experience, pleasant feelings, seeing a tunnel, a light, disease relatives, or a life review. And many circumstances are described during which NDE are reported, such as cardiac arrest, clinical death, shock after loss of blood, childbirth, coma following traumatic brain injury or stroke, near drowning, children, or asphyxia, but also in serious diseases not immediately life-threatening, during depression or isolation, or without any obvious reason. A similar experiences to near-death ones can occur during the terminal phase of illness and are called deathbed visions or end-of-life experiences. So ap apparently you don't always need a non-functioning brain to report an NDE. And the NDE is transformational, always causing enhanced intuitive sensibility, profound changes in life inside and a loss of the fear of death. And the death experiences occur with increasing frequency because of the improved survival rates resulting from modern techniques of resuscitation. The content, the content of an NDE and the effects on patients seem similar worldwide across all cultures and in all times. However, the subjective nature and the absence of a frame of reference for this experience lead to individual, cultural and religious factors determining the vocabulary used to describe and to interpret the experience. Children will use different words as adults and Christians different as atheists, Muslims or Buddhists. They all use different words from their own religion, culture and tradition. According to a recent at random poll in Germany and the USA, about 4% of the total population in the Western world should have experienced an NDE. So more than 9 million people in the USA and 4 million people in the UK should have had an NDE. Millions of people. Now, 
Why do we 